so we are continuing on and we're jumping in today uh, to the, this whole idea of uh, defeater beliefs for Christianity. And just by way of review to get us warmed up, sometimes I, I just call this stretching our legs, let's, let's do that. And so um, we've got four defeater beliefs that we're going to look at um, <clears throat> today, well I'm sorry, this week, and today we're going to pick the first one. Again, just to remind you what a defeater belief is, is some belief A that if true would rule out belief B. And then you can see I wrote uh, belief B up on the board for us now, is Christianity is true. And just to kind of get us going, can, you, can somebody tell me how is this defeater belief, number one, how is that a defeater for belief B, for Christianity? How is this a threat? Somebody just walk us through that briefly. Yeah. It doesn't matter if the God of the Bible is true. If he's a monster, we should bang together and defeat him. Okay, good. Yeah, that's not, uh, <laughs> it's not the kind of God we want to worship. Right. That, that's good. That works. <laughs> I don't know about the band together part, but that works. And, and Christianity holds that, that God is morally good. But if God is a moral monster in the Old Testament, well, that's not the right God. So, okay, how about this one? Miracles are impossible. How's this a defeater belief for Christianity? Yeah, right. Well, even if you go back to our two greatest holidays, one's the miracle of the virgin birth, mm -hmm. the other is the miracle of the resurrection at right. Easter time. So if those two are false, yep. we've got some more problems. Yes, yes, yeah, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if, if the resurrection didn't happen, then our faith is futile. So if miracles aren't possible, well, gosh, the resurrection is a problem. And not just that, but the doctrine of creation. That's, that's the miracle, creation out of nothing. And so all of Christianity is predicated on miracles. Okay, how about this one? This will be the third one we'll look at. Evil and suffering and hell are incompatible with God's existence. How is this a defeater belief? Well, yeah, how, how is this a problem? Yeah. If God is a God of love, then he obviously would not yes. create a world that had evil and suffering and hell. Okay, good. That's, that's perfect. That's great. If God is all loving, why would he cause us to suffer? Why would he condemn us for an infinite duration of everlasting torment and hell and, and all that stuff? So that's a problem. And then this is the last one that we'll look at. There's no one true religion. So why is that a defeater belief for Christianity? Yeah. Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except for me. Good. And if that's the case, um, but if that is true, well, then Jesus wasn't speaking the truth. So, okay. Great. Are we warmed up? Stretched a little? All right. So, um, so today, like I said, we're going to look at the first one of those, this whole God is a moral monster. I know you guys struggled with that on your worksheets, and that's okay. Um, uh, the part of the struggle is to help you, um, believe it or not, and uh, it'll help, help you as we engage the topic today to wrestle with that. So let me introduce you to, we mentioned Richard, Richard Dawkins. I know you guys are familiar with him, but if you're not, this is his latest book. It's called The God Delusion. Has anybody read this yet? Okay, skimmed it. It's not worth reading super much. Um, I mean, it's, it is bad, but... Uh, so Richard Dawkins, th this guy and some of his sort of cohorts are what are called the New Atheists. And uh, I'll tell you why it's not worth reading in a minute, by the way. But um, so the New Atheists, who are the New Atheists and why are they New Atheists as opposed to just Atheists? Well, what's interesting about the New Atheists, uh, I guess the Four Horsemen, as, as they're sometimes called, of the New Atheist movement are Richard Dawkins, a guy named Chris Christopher Hitchens who just passed away, a guy named Sam Harris, a guy named Daniel Dennett. So these four are what were, what have been called probably about five years ago, the four horsemen of the new atheism. So why is it new? Well, what's interesting, there's not much new about new atheism. In fact, if you do read chapter two of this book, which is the God Hypothesis and Arguments for God, uh, chapter three, it's embarrassing, especially to a philosopher, to read this guy try to work his way through the arguments for God. They're really, really bad. And the, the kinds of uh, discussion and the kinds of uh, sort of arguments he gives are arguments that have been around for hundreds of years. They're kind of recycled atheistic arguments that aren't really good at all. They're embarrassing. Um, but so what's new about them? Well, what's new about them is their rhetoric. And so they've ratched up the rhetoric and, and specifically in three ways. And this is the rhetoric. They say that religion is dangerous, it's delusional, and it's destructive. So that, that's, the new, that's why they're new atheists. It's the rhetoric that's changed. The arguments are the same, they're recycled, they're, they're old, they're, they're not any good, but the rhetoric is really strong. It's dangerous because 
people in the name of God fly planes into buildings. And they blow up bombs, you know, blow up people and, and all these things. So it's dangerous. Uh, it's destructive because religion is foisted on your children and it's kind of like child abuse. So it's just destructive to families. And then it's, uh, let's see, dangerous, destructive, and delusional. It's delusional because, well, you're asking people to believe something that's contra rationality, that is irrational. It's a blind leap of faith. And of course, faith is synonymous usually with, with irrationality or, or things like that. And so, so that's what's uh, the deal with the new atheists. Now tomorrow I'll introduce you to some of the new, new atheists. And so they've actually moved beyond that now. But um, these were the new atheists. And Richard Dawkins, of course, was one of the most vocal about that. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll watch a trailer for the, the newest movie that's coming out. Did you guys hear about the movie that's coming out this summer? It's called Unbelievers, and it's Richard Dawkins and a guy named Lawrence Krauss. And maybe we'll watch it tomorrow because it's, it'll be relevant to the topic for tomorrow. But they are, they're very vocal. And what I want to show you here is this clip um, of Richard Dawkins reading the uh, text that you have in your structure notes. And, I, and just, I want you to read this and just let it sink in uh, because this is the objection that he and others have been vor forcefully sort of pushing uh, against Christianity. So here we go. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> okay. So how do you respond? How, what does that do to you as you watch that? How do you respond to that? Yeah, that is sad. Yeah. I think God is so merciful not to just end his life. <laughs> That's true. I mean, yeah. yeah, seriously, yeah. So yeah, false. yeah, lots of false. So, and some anger, even, right? I mean, maybe, you know? Yeah, this is, and it gets worse, and I, I put, I, just so you could sort of feel the force of it, I put this all in your notes. Let me just read through these. It's in your structure notes. Just sit on this for a minute. Just kind of allow yourself to feel the force of these charges, okay? Because this, this is what I want to wrestle with today. So again, I'm just going to quote, this is all from uh, this book, some of these quotes. Uh, Dawkins, he says, what makes my jaw drop is that people today should base their lives on such an appalling role model as Yahweh. And even worse, that they should bossily try to force that same evil monster on the rest of us. And then more, just some bullet points. Uh, Dawkins score, uh, God's commanding Abraham to sacrifice Isaac is disgraceful and tantamount to child abuse and bullying. When the Israelites flirt with a rival God, Yahweh breaks into, quote, a monumental rage resembling nothing so much as sexual jealousy of the worst kind. Uh, the killing of the Canaanites, we'll wrestle with that. We'll do a case study on them today. <clears throat> he says that that's an ethnic cleansing in which bloodthirsty massacres were carried out with xenophobic relish. Joshua's destruction of Jericho, we'll talk about that. Ordered by God is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland, or Saddam Hussein's massacre of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. And then he just goes on and on and on. Finally, to make matters work, there's the ubiquitous weirdness of the Bible. Uh, Dawkins draws attention to the moral failures of various biblical characters. You know, he talks a lot about this drunken lot seduced by and engaging in sexual relationships with his daughters in Genesis 19. Abraham lying twice about his wife, Sarah, uh, and, and more, lots more. And then really you could add to all the, the verbiage that you read in uh, this book, you can add the charge uh, that, that we hear often that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and hatred, but the God of the New Testament or the Jesus of the New Testament is a God of love. And it's kind of the idea that maybe you have two gods in scripture, you know, the God of the Old and the God of the New, one of anger and hate and one of love and mercy. And so we're left with this question, you know, what do we do with this? What do we think of this charge? You know, is this fair? Is God a moral monster? And more than that, is the God of the Old Testament the same God that's revealed in the New Testament? So hopefully you feel the force of this. What would you guys say, what's, what would maybe be some quick responses or reactions that we might push back on with these kinds of objections that I just read from his book? Yeah. Yeah. Um, where does he get his moral standards 
Okay, good, perfect, love it. Yeah, so, and in fact, he's in, uh, Dawkins is in print uh, arguing that there is no such thing as objective goodness and badness. So if that's the case, how can you claim that God, how can you ascribe a moral property to God? So that's great, and so we'll bring that up. Perfect, yeah. There's a few more details on the edges of those stories. Absolutely, so could it be context? Maybe it would be helpful. Like hermeneutics, Bible study methods 101, yeah, that'd be great. If he said there's no objective goodness, then how can he make these charges? Okay, yeah, great, and he can't, and that'll be... Yeah, it'll be an inconsistency, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll want to point that out. He admits the, uh, the passages about God's love, mercy, and uh-huh. kindness. Yeah, kind of selective attention, for sure. Okay, yeah. He, yeah, I mean, along those lines, he omits the whole story of Nineveh with Jonah going there and never mm-hmm. repenting. When they repent, he doesn't destroy them. Yeah, okay. So there's, good, so there's, there's positive attributes that he's not worried about, just the negative, yeah. Oh. Because the story is in the Bible doesn't mean God approves it. True. And so, the, so that, that is great for when it's our moral failures. But when it's God commanding genocide or God doing something that we would judge as wrong, that's where, that's where that doesn't quite help. But that is, that is going to be helpful for some. Mm-hmm. And do you guys know the distinction, the distinction between descriptive and prescriptive uh, in, in Scripture? So there's things that we would read that are morally reprehensible in Scripture. And we don't prescribe them, but they're still there because a lot of times we're recording history. And that's, that's okay, even though it's God's word. It's not prescribing that we ought to commit adultery and then kill the husband or something, but, um, but it's there, and that's true. Yeah? Well, even the side of history itself, dealing with Hitler, with Saddam Hussein, mm-hmm. um, there was a lot of killing that took place in order to get rid of a greater evil, mm-hmm. yep. and that's a tough one to deal with, but that's there. Okay. Okay, good. So that actually begins to get to the heart of this charge about um, God commanding something that looks evil. Is it, it, could he have a morally sufficient reason for that? And we'll have to come back to that at some point, for sure. Okay? Good. So th- this is good. Uh, hopefully, I, I love how you guys are wrestling with this is all, um, or already. Let me tell you what I want to do. I want to share three misses that I think Dawkins and uh, the new atheists and people that level this charge, uh, three misses that will kind of help us navigate through this. And then kind of in the midst of the second miss, I want to pull back and do a case study uh, on one that actually really had troubled me when I first began to think about this. And that was the whole, why did God command um, Israelite to destroy and drive out and annihilate all of the Canaanites? And so we'll actually do a case study on that one. We'll drill pretty deep into that one and see if we can get some answers to that as kind of an example how we might approach some of these other ones. Uh, and then once we do the, th- the near misses, we'll watch some videos of some other scholars and see what they have to say. And then after that, we'll, dribble, we'll, we'll drill down into that question of uh, atheism. Can it sustain uh, moral values? Can it sustain you know, this objective morality issue? Can it sustain meaning and purpose and so on? Uh, some of the stuff that you read about as well. Okay? So that's the goal. So here's the three misses that uh, I see. You can you feel free to put them in uh, your notes now. We'll, we'll go through each of these uh, as well. Uh, the first miss, I think that this charge that God is a moral monster is false for at least these three reasons. One, it misconstrues the nature of God, and so we'll look at that. Uh, two, it misconstrues or ignores the nature and historical setting of the Old Testament. This would be the context issue, the doing good Bible study issue that you guys brought up. And then three, uh, when given by an atheist such as Dawkins, this charge is utterly inconsistent. This will be what you guys already brought up. Um, He he can't help himself to this claim since he denies that there is objective moral values. And so that's what we're going to sort of work through. So let's begin with the first one. Okay, uh, the nature of God. So uh, let's see. Uh, Dawkins and other new atheists, I'm looking off your structured notes now, uh, wonder how God who is so, well, God-centered, can't also be accused of narcissism and vanity. And so he quotes things. You know, he's out to make a name for himself, as 2 Samuel 7 says. He delivers his people from Egypt for the sake of his name, and so on. And so the question is this. Does God have an unhealthy self-preoccupation or not? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, if I was saying those things about myself, I am finite. Good. Okay. <laughs> Except for, yeah, gotcha. But for God, he can say that he's great 
Mm -hmm. He can uh, boast about his achievements. He can talk about how great his character is because he's God. So he's okay. unique in his ability to do that. And, and it isn't yeah. uh, arrogant if it's true. Okay, good. I love it. Perfect. So here's something that I learned um, very early on. Actually, when I was in seminary, uh, J.P. Moreland said, if we want to be good thinkers, we need to learn to make distinctions. And I would add, if we want to be good teachers, we need to learn to teach distinctions. So, so really, to handle the, this kind of charge that Richard Dawkins makes, we just need to learn to make some distinctions. And you actually did it perfectly for us. Uh, and one sort of helpful distinction would be between pride and humility. And what are they? So for example, what is pride? So we just I don't know, give us a definition as best you can. What, what is pride? Thinking of yourself more highly than you should. Perfect. Yeah, thinking of yourself more highly than you should. So pride is an inflation of ourself. It's an inflation of our, of our view. It's a false advertising campaign, promoting ourselves because we suspect others uh, you know, won't really accept us for who they are, who we are, or something like that. Yeah, Milton. Some, some might say that pride is a poor uh, concept of God. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. OK. Can you explain a little more? Hmm. Who God is, how great he is, yeah. um, all the attributes of who he is, I have a better perspective of who I am. He's right. Humble. Excellent. That's wonderful. Yeah, Luther said that pride is the, the uh, fundamental uh, sin from which all else flourish because it's a, real, a rooting of self instead of God as the center. Yeah, good. So pride is a sort of inflated view of ourselves. Humility, on the other hand, and this is that helpful distinction, involves having a realistic assessment of ourselves. It's exactly what you just said. Um, so for example, and, and this, you know, this is, should be obvious, so say Yo-Yo Ma says, oh, I'm just not really good at playing the cello, or LeBron James, ah, I'm not really good at playing basketball. Now would that be, would that be um, humility? No, it'd be a false humility. Why? Well, because he really is good. They really are good at, at playing the cello or playing basketball. And so true humility, and so here's the thing, true humility doesn't deny our abilities, rather just it gives uh, acknowledgement to the giver of the gift, right, in this case, God. And so that would be true humility. So here's the question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's true. It all depends on the, the, the spirit of the, the comment, really. You know, it, so it would be true, but, um, but he wouldn't be prideful if he's just saying, you know, yeah, I'm really good at this, and I'm just grateful to God for this, these gifts that he's given me. That's okay. That's, that's humility, actually. Does that make sense? Um, so then ask the question about God. Is God proud? Is God prideful? And again, uh, the answer would be no, because he has a realistic view of himself. Right? Um, he doesn't have a false, he doesn't have an exaggerated view. In fact, by definition, uh, we would say God is the greatest conceivable being. So this is Anselm back in the Middle Ages. That, that, that was the definition that was offered about who God is. The greatest conceivable being. However, you know, whatever you think the greatest is, well, that is God. God is a personal being worthy of worship. And if that's the case, and God, God has, well, then, uh, if that's the case, God doesn't take more credit than he deserves, because he's the greatest possible being that there is. In fact, he's quite accurate about himself. So here's, and you could drill down on this. So humility, there's a couple characteristics of humility. Um, somebody's humble if they're other-centered. And so you could ask that about God. Is he other-centered? Do you see in the Old Testament? Can you think of examples where God is other-centered in the Old Testament, for example? Like just well, think about the Old Testament. What would be some examples? Saved Israel out of Egypt. He's constantly drawing people that are outside of Israel into his people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah 57, 15 says, The high and exalted one, God, dwells with the contrite and lowly in spirit. Uh, Psalm 113, verses 5 and 6 affirms that God stoops down and looks upon us. Um, all these interactions with Israel that you mentioned. Um, and not just that, you expand to the New Testament and we have just a, a further revelation of God's other-centeredness in the Incarnation. You know, here's God who actually pursues man um, and becomes one of us. And, this, and that act, by the way, is so radical. We just, I think we become so familiar with the Incarnation that we, we, le we cease to see how subversive that is to the sort of um, ancient Near East mindset. Because in the ancient Near East, and I've read the literature, I, I love that I get to teach this stuff because you, you see this, in the ancient Near East, uh, man is meant to serve God. But in scripture, it's subversive. It turns it upside down where God serves man and actually pursues us and becomes one of us. And that's, that's pretty amazing. 
actually. Another characteristic of humility is um, self-giving. And of course, again, we see this uh, both in the Old Testament um, and in the New Testament and, and so on. So the first charge, arrogant or humble, I'd say, you know, Dawkins is a little misplaced there. And, it just, and it's all we need to do is make distinctions on what these terms are. Are we okay so far? Any questions on the first one? Yeah. What about the, the complaint that God didn't need to vocalize how great he is, okay. um, but in being in itself should have been satisfied with the reality that he is? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think there's a number of things that we can say, and again, this is where theology has to enter into our apologetics, right? And so one thing to say is, well, if our greatest good, so what's the first, uh, you know, the Westminster Confession, what is man's greatest need? It's to know God and to enjoy him forever. And so how can we know God unless we, God reveals things about him to us? And so, so what is revelation? It's just God revealing himself to us so that we might flourish in light of our natures. And so in that sense, it seems appropriate, in fact, because our, our greatest good, our highest need is to know God. So in that sense, so that seems to take care of that worry, to me, at least. That's a great question. Great question. Yeah. I think it goes into the context a little bit, too, because yeah. it seems like we forget sometimes that there were all these other gods people were worshiping, and those mm -hmm. were calling out for people's attention. Right. Mm -hmm. They were sacrificing to them, and they were doing it. And so God, in a way, I think, had to you know, stand on the stage of Israel and say, this is mm -hmm. who I am. Look who I am and follow me. So yeah. I think we forget sometimes there were all these other gods calling mm -hmm. out. Yeah, that's really that's really helpful. Yeah, Milton. I mean, another uh, challenge we had too, because it's difficult for us to be able to say statements in a true way without the drop of pride right. in the midst of it. And so mm -hmm. at times we have to glorify God and think that He He would do the same thing. That's right. Good. Excellent. Yeah, everything we do have mixed motives, but not so for God. Yeah, even on our best days. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go to the second one here. Uh, again, another charge by uh, the new atheist. God is angry, uh, he's jealous, he's petty, he's insecure, or is he um, king-like and loving? So on, back to your structure notes. Does, as Dawkins claimed, God fly into a, quote, monumental rage whenever his chosen people flirted with a rival God? Uh, is God easily provoked? Is he petty? Is he an insecure deity? What do you think about this one? Just Quick reactions to that, yeah. I mean, he's looking at it as a jealous lover where it's more like a uh, loving parent. Okay. Because as a parent, when you see your kids doing something that's going to harm them, mm -hmm. long term, you're going to want to stop them okay. rather than let them continue. Great. Perfect. And you, again, you just, you helped to draw this distinction. So the way to navigate these kinds of things is to, again, make distinctions. So here would be another one. We've got, let's just pick on jealousy for a minute. So here's the thing, though. Jealousy can be good. And it can be bad. And you just gave an example of, of, I think, a good kind of jealousy. So jealousy is bad when it uh, protects the petty. But jealousy is good when it guards the precious. And that's the parent example is a great one. And so again, jealousy itself, it, I mean, you can't just say, well, God is jealous. Well, it depends. There's good jealousy. There's bad jealousy. You know, is it um, good jealousy is other-centered, and then of course, and bad je jealousy is self-centered. So I love the parent example. You can think of a marriage. So say that um, I don't know. You saw, say say that uh, a wife. You know, if a wife doesn't get jealous when somebody was flirting with her husband, well, then you would say there's something inappropriate. There's something wrong about her commitment in that marriage, right? If she, if she's not outraged and angry and jealous for that. Um, something's not right. And so too, I would say, with God. You know, God is a person. Uh, he's not some abstract principle. Um, and what's interesting is that God is a, you know, he's like, in the Old Testament he's talked about as, as, he's likened to a passionate husband. So the marriage analogy is actually a really good one for God. And what's interesting in Scripture, anytime, if you, if you would do like a word search on jealousy in the Old Testament, anytime God is described as jealous, well, it's always in the context of human idolatry. So God is jealous that we would rightly worship in truth, and we would worship him. And so that's, that's the context. It's this other-centered jealousy that we would worship um, him. And in fact, in the New Testament, like in James 4, 4, um, this sort of worldly pursuit 
or I should say worldly pursuits over our relationship with God, they're actually called adulterous. You know, it's, so it's that same kind of marital language, and, and it rightly provokes God's jealousy. And actually, I think that, that that's, this is amazing. Think about this. The creator of the universe is that concerned about us. You know, he's that deeply connected to human beings. And again, I want to come back to that um, at the end of our day. And by the way, I should have said before we, we began, I wish I would have, but let me just say it to you now. One of the things I want to convince you of today, so remember I have subtext, I'm, just, I'm going to tell you my subtext for this time today, is that I want to convince you that God is actually better than you think. And I want you to consider the possibility that God is better than you think, than I think today, okay? And so that's where we're headed. And one of the things, just this, this jealousy, uh, we should be amazed that the creator of the universe is that concerned that he connects our, himself so deeply to us. Yeah, it's true in a sense. Um, I mean, there's rhetoric in there, right? Monumental, rage, those are pejorative terms. Um, I think it's not charitable at the least. And we all know what he, he doesn't mean that to be a good aspiration. aspiration. But yeah, we could. When you're talking to somebody who says that, can you say, well, you know, uh -huh. in one sense you're right. Yeah, and then I would just qualify it with all these kinds of things, yeah. Or I would, again, make distinctions, teach distinctions, and that then, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Isn't um, God's jealousy, in fact, self-centered? Not just only other-centered? Um, he it, wants to give, yeah. receive all the glory. Yeah, I mean, I can see where that, that seems to make some sense, too. Um, and maybe we just have to go back to, um, you know, what we said earlier. Well, that's because our greatest need is to know him. So, yeah, I, I, think, I, could go, I think I could go down that, that with you, too. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, I would actually disagree with the statement that he flies into a monumental rage whenever his chosen people flirt with an idol because I think there are examples of him being long suffering and patience with the children of Israel. Good. Um, prophets being a good example of that. Good. Yeah. And in a lot of occasions he sent prophets to warn them mm -hmm. or to brush them. Yeah. And so I think it takes a balanced view of mm -hmm. there is rage, but there's also compassion and need. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right. Now, the more that I think about it, you're absolutely right. We'll look at the Canaanite thing. God was incredibly patient with the Canaanites. In fact, it says 430 years he gave them before judgment. So that's, that's, actually, that's really good, too. Great. Okay, let's move on to anger. So jealousy, pride. How about anger? Is God angry? Well, again, it's the same thing. You know, and it's, by now you should kind of see how we're going here. Well, there's good and there's bad anger. Um, and it's the same kind of thing, good, angry. To, to, to be good in your anger is to be other-centered. Bad anger is when you're self-centered. And so, for example, here's a great example of bad anger. Apart from probably our own lives, we can illustrate this, I'm sure. I know I can. Um, uh, Homer's Iliad. Has anybody read the Iliad before? So the first line of that, so if you go back, if you, if you can go find this, the first line, it begins this way. It says, rage. The rage of Achilles was responsible for untold blood that was spilled with the Greeks and the Trojans. And then for, uh, you know, 10 books, you, you read of death and destruction. There's like 246 deaths that are recorded, but thousands of people are killed in this four-day battle that you read about with the fall of Troy. And it's all because of Achilles and this petty argument over, well, a woman, actually. Um, but it's, it's a petty argument because the king took his war prize, which was this girl, and he got upset and he got mad, and so he flew into this monumental rage and, and wouldn't fight, and just led to destruction. So there's a great illustration of bad anger. So anyway, great read, too. Um, so is God angry? Well, yes, you know, we see anger uh, with God, but again, what's important to point out is that anger and love are not mutually exclusive. You know, it's actually Jesus in the temple. There's anger there, but it's not inappropriate. Ephesians 4.26 doesn't say, do not um, let the sun grow, go down on your anger, or do not <coughs> sin in your anger, but it's still, there's this distinction. There are good, there are appropriate times to be angry. In fact, we would actually be morally deficient if we weren't angry at times. And our, our job is to be angry over the right things, and to be repulsed over the right things. Um, so. 
Again, when Dawkins and those like that make these claims, they're just running roughshod over all these really important distinctions. And as good thinkers, we want to learn to communicate those. We want to learn to have them ourselves. And this is just examples of how to do that. Okay? Any questions? Milton. Exactly. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And so we want to model charity in our conversations by learning to listen. Um, the kinds of things that I don't think Richard Dawkins in his book, you know, models towards the Christian faith, you know, towards believers. Yeah. And so we want to model charity. When we want to learn to listen, and then we want to learn to teach these distinctions. Um, so. I love this quote, you know, we've got to throw in a Lewis quote all the time. Every five minutes is probably good for our health. Um, here's one, this is a, a, you guys might have heard of this quote from The Weight of Glory. It's a classic essay by him. But what I like about it is um, it kind of shows that, you know, we have this charge that God is a moral monster. But Lewis just flips that upside down. No, actually, we're the morally deficient people, beings, persons, not God. You know, and so Lewis, he says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. So I would say, just in terms of this first miss, um, God is good. God is good all the time, in fact. Uh, you know, yes, he can be violent. Yes, he punishes wrongdoing. But he, but he does that to protect the weak or to punish the wicked. Uh, and when he's angry, he's legitimately so. Um, over evil, over injustice, over idolatry, over oppression, and so on. So, anyway, that's maybe enough to say on this first miss. Okay, any last questions on the first one? We've got two more to do. Good. Okay, let's just uh, jump into the second one. Uh, we'll maybe get a little bit through it. We'll sh watch a video and then we'll take our break. Um, okay, so back to your structured notes. Miss number two is that, again, Dawkins, Dawkins and those like him uh, ignore the nature and the historical setting of the Old Testament. And let me, let me fill in your blanks there. The first one, Dawkins ignores the unique status of Israel's theocracy. So what is a theocracy? So let me just briefly give us a sentence. God is the ruler. Okay, good. Yeah, God is the ruler of the country. The country. Yeah, it's great. There's no separation of church and state. God is the king, the president, all that stuff. Um, yeah, and so Dawkins, he's concerned, and here's the quote, those who bossily try to force that same evil monster on the rest of us, but those who scare Dawkins actually kind of scare me. They probably scare you too. Um, maybe it would be like contemporary, there's actually, they're called uh, theonomists. So there's contemporary theonomists. There's another group called Manifest Destiny Americans. And these would be the people, I don't know if you have the similar in Canada, but these would be people that want to return America, for example, to, to become a Christian nation again. And to sort of have that kind of a theocracy. And so what Dawkins fails to realize is that I Israel's theocracy, at least biblically, was short-lived. It was unique, it was non-repeatable, and it was for a specific purpose in the progressive revelation of God to the world. And, uh, and that's it. And in fact, that, that theocracy came to a dramatic end in AD 70 with the fall of Jerusalem. And now, as we are in the New Testament era, we are an inter-ethnic community uh, of Christians that has emerged as the true Israel, right? And so Dawkins assumes that consistent Christianity is, when, when he assumes that consistent Christianity is this theor, theor, theocratic version of Christianity, well, he's just being, un, well, he's being uncharitable, but then he's not doing uh, a good job with the text as well. So that'd be the first thing I'd say. There's a couple more. I'll, let me get through these and we can talk about it. Uh, the second little blank for you here, Dawkins wrongly assumes that the Old Testament presents an ideal ethic uh, while ignoring the Old Testament's redemptive spirit and creational ideals. Now, this is a little harder to follow, so I want to recommend to you two books if you're interested in this. Uh, one is by this guy named Paul Copen. Here's the book. 
It's called, Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament God. Highly recommend it. Uh, excellent, excellent resource. Paul's a great thinker. Uh, he's, a good, he's a really good guy as well, and so I recommend that to you. And then the second one um, that I would highly recommend is called God Behaving Badly. And this is in your structure notes in the uh, end. Is, and I love the subtitle. Is, God, is the God of the Old Testament angry, sexist, and racist? So you can come up and look at these. Uh, in fact, I'll just pass them around if you want to look at them. So if you want more, David Lamb. And it should be in the back of your structure notes for this lecture. Anyway, so Paul Copen, uh, this is what he talks about, this second bullet point that we're looking at. And you've got some in your text there. He says, the Christian can agree that the Old Testament reflects a problematic and more primitive ancient Near East, that's the A&E, moral framework, which Israel assimilates. Rather than idealize it, though, we should look to certain fixed creational considerations, say found in Genesis 1 and 2 and 12, to inform us as we navigate the Old Testament challenging waters. In other words, all of that, in, uh, in other words, these difficult passages, the ones that we quoted, that we read from Dawkins early on, these difficult passages need to be interpreted, I would say, in light of the clear teachings of Scripture, right? Isn't that like Bible study methods 101 that we all learned in IBS? Um, and so, and I guess the larger point is that while rhetorically effective, uh, the kinds of claims that Dawkins makes and the other new atheists, they really don't handle the biblical text with care. And in fact, I was reading one Old Testament scholar who, who said that there's no simple route to developing an Old Testament ethics. You just, you there's no simple way to read that off the page. You really need to do the context. You need to take into consideration uh, things like the progressive nature of Revelation, um, the, bit, the larger biblical narrative, which includes the law of Moses and Christ's fulfillment of that law. Um, you need to take into consideration the ancient Near East historical context and legal context and more. And in fact, so reading the history of ideas, um, what's interesting, you have this really interesting shift that takes place somewhere in the, in, in the corpus of literature between Rex Lex and Lex Rex. So here's what happens. Can I, okay, where's my Latin scholars? You guys didn't get totally leggy. Um, anybody know what this says? What's Rex? King. king. What's Lex? Law. So the first one is the king is law. And at some point, we saw a transition to the law is king. And so if you, if you go way back to the, to the sort of first literature that we have of the Western world, so, uh, there would be a text called the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the first um, stories that we have of the ancient world. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is like, uh, it's Iraq, uh, 2,700, you know, 4,700 years ago. Um, you have Rex Lex. You have this king that is law. Whatever he wants to do is law. And so he has this, so he was just kind of a bully to this city that as you read this, and he would basically um, steal brides from their wedding nights and have sex with them, and, and just whatever he wanted to do, that's what he would do. And you read about that, and then as you continue on in sort of the history of ideas, reading text, you still see this, but some, at some point there's a transition. And, if, and in the Bible, there's a clear transition to the law is king. And then you have a lawgiver, of course, who's good and moral and holy. And that's a, that's a huge improvement in the ancient Near East co uh, context than the stuff that's come before. And so, anyway, there's all these interesting things going on in the historical context that we need to be familiar with if we're going to do justice to the Old Testament. That's kind of the point, I guess. Okay. Any questions? Ancient Near East. Yeah. I'm going to show you a video um, after the break where Bill Craig, the guy who's your On Guard book author, he, um, he invited Dawkins to debate. Uh, to a debate, and Dawkins said, I refuse to debate anybody who, who um, believes that the Canaanites committed genocide because of God. And so, he, so in other words, Dawkins refuses to listen to this. And so the debate I'll show you was actually took place in Oxford last year, um, where they invited Richard Dawkins, there was an empty chair, and there was just Bill. And so Bill is going to give all these reasons, and Dawkins won't, he, he, um, he won't listen to them. In fact, after that happened, um, he said something, he basically just ridiculed Bill Craig and said, that's just ridiculous, it's silly. So he just, he doesn't, it just is not plausible. And so he's not going to consider it at all. Yeah? Could you give us a timeline again for Rex Lex versus Lex Rex? Well, um, nobody knows for sure. 
But uh, I'll just say like the epic, if I can remember, epic of Gilgamesh is one of the first um, writings that we have, and it was supposedly around 27 BC, well, I should say stories that comes to us. And by the time you get to um, some of the Greek writers, I'm sure you can all read this back in the back, um, so I'll just do it anyhow. Uh, by the time you get to the Greek writers that are writing around the 450s, um, you see clear shift. And then, of course, the Old Testament, you know, if Moses is 1600s, um, you see somewhere in between there. Here you have a clear shift. You've got um, what are called, you've got these Greek tragedies called the Oresteia cycle, um, where you see a, a clear shift from uh, the king is law to the law is king, and you have this, it's a great, uh, where Athens becomes a city on the hill. Actually, if you read this, Athens is a city on the hill that will judge justly uh, and be a light to the world. It's really fascinating uh, in light of Christianity and Christ. Um, but that's, that's in the, you know, 400s. So somewhere in there, there was a shift, but it's not clear. Let's watch this video. This is uh, D.A. Carson. We'll watch this, and then we'll take a break. Um, D.A. Carson on the question of uh, the God of the Old Testament. D.A. Carson is a, another fine scholar that I'd recommend to you, especially on the biblical text, um, and he teaches at Trinity. So let's hear what he has to say. Many of those who think that the portrayal of God in the Old Testament can't be squared with the portrayal of God in the New have a mental image that runs something like this. In the Old Testament, God is strict, not to say simply righteous, even a bit bad-tempered, and sometimes, quite frankly, cruel. And then you come to the God of the New Testament, and it's gentle Jesus, meek and mild, turn the other cheek, be friendly, be gentle, love one another. And, and thus, the, the two pictures of God cannot be squared. They're two different religions. But I would want to argue that this is a very short-sighted, even distorted reading of both the Old Testament and the New. So that in the Old Testament, for example, there are these scenes of judgment, all right, but God is regularly described as the one who is slow to anger, abounding, abounding in love and faithfulness. He will not always chide. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He's pictured by the prophet Hosea, 8th century B.C., as as the almighty cookhold, that is the betrayed husband who's actually betrayed by his people and is broken hearted and, and sad and is going after her even though she's committing a kind of spiritual adultery. Um, in tears, turn, turn, why will you die? The Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's all part of the Old Testament picture of God. And in the New Testament it is true that there is a lot of emphasis on love and forgiveness and forbearance, all to be celebrated gloriously. But on the other hand, the New Testament speaks far more directly and frequently about hell. And the person who has the greatest variety of images of hell, all of them horrifying in one fashion or another in the pages of the New Testament on his lips, is Jesus himself. And there are some passages that are so horrific that it is hard even to read them in public. Read, for example, the end of um, uh, Revelation 14. Um, so the God of the New Testament is likewise depicted as a God of judgment, a God of justice, and who will finally hold people to account. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, whether in, in, in fear and trembling or in, in repentance and joy. So instead of saying that when you move from the Old Testament to the New, you move from an angry God to a loving God, I think it's far, far closer to the truth to say that as you move from the Old Testament to the New, the picture of God as a loving God is ratcheted up. So that sometimes God is portrayed as a God of wrath and judgment in the Old Testament, but, but quite frankly, the, the picture of God as a God of righteousness and wrath is ratcheted up to hell itself. But the picture of God as a loving God, yes, they're wonderful images, but it's ratcheted up to Christ himself. And both of these themes barrel through both testaments and only find their resolution again in the cross itself. So I suspect that the reason why some people think that the pictures of judgment in the Old Testament are much more severe than the pictures of judgment in the New is because, quite frankly, they're such naturalists that they're far more frightened of natural suffering 
disaster, disease, famine, war, plague. They're much more frightened of that sort of thing than they are of hell itself. But when you take the Bible in its own terms, there is a ratcheting up of both the pictures of God's love and the pictures of God's judgment as you move from the Old Testament to the New. And, and, and no softening of either, a, a, an intensifying of both, until finally they are resolved once again in the cross. If you want to see what judgment looks like, go to the cross. If you want to see what love looks like, go to the cross. Isn't that great? I love that uh, observation about uh, the reason why the God of the Old Testament looks so bad is because they're naturalists, probably. I thought that, that's, I think that's really brilliant. I, I found it helpful for myself just to dig into this, so would it be helpful to, to dig into this case study on the Canaanites? Would that be okay? Okay. So, so you can see the scripture. It's, I think it's on your structure notes. It's up here, too. Again, let's just look at it, let it sink in, and then let's think about, okay, if somebody brings that question up, how would we respond to it? And I want to at least give you some things that I have found helpful in terms not just of how to make sense of it myself, but also how to engage it dialectically with others, or how to engage it in conversation with others. All right, so the passage. This is in uh, Deuteronomy. However, in the cities of the nations that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. Okay, so here we see God ordering, uh, you know, or commanding Israel to kill the Canaanites. And the question is, is it tantamount to ethnic cleansing or indiscriminate massacre? Uh, is God immoral for commanding the killing? of the Canaanites. That, that's basically the question. Is God immoral for commanding the, the killing of the Canaanites? Any initial thoughts before we sort of jump into how to respond? Yeah. Just on the ethnic cleansing part, that would be because that ethnicity is worse, and in Deuteronomy it says clearly that that's not why God is doing that. That's right. The Israelites any better. That's right, yeah. As it turns out, it has nothing to do with ethnicity. It's sin, as we'll, as we'll see. Yeah, good. Hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Good. I don't know the context of these particular people groups, but oftentimes in the Old Testament you hear about these people that would worship their gods by killing babies, and, yeah. and so they do even worse things. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yep, we'll talk about that. Okay, good. Yeah, let's, um, here's what I think is a helpful response, and in doing this you'll see how I would respond to it in, co in conversation as well as also what has been helpful to me. It's actually, I respond to that question uh, the question again is, is God immoral for commanding the killing of the Canaanites? I respond to that question with two questions of my own to the person who asks it. And the two questions are this. Here's the first one right there. Uh, when God judges the Canaanites to death, does he do so arbitrarily? That's the first question. And of course, and, and the answer is no. And I say so for three reasons. This is really interesting. Let me tell you. The first reason is this, and we mentioned it earlier. Uh, is the fact that God actually waited 430 years, according to Genesis 15, 16. So you can write that down and look it up. He waited 430 years because the sins of the Amorites, who were one of the Canaanite people groups, had not yet reached his, its limit. So in other words, in Abraham's day, the time wasn't right for judgment on the Canaanites. And, and uh, that's why he didn't drive them out. So, so the first point is that God was incredibly patient. That's the first thing to say. The second thing under why this is, why God is not arbitrary is what you just said right here. Um, the fact is the Canaanites were exceedingly wicked people. Um, God tells Israel in Deuteronomy 9.5 that it was not because of, quote, your righteousness or your integrity, but, quote, on account of the wickedness of the nations that he was going to drive out the Canaanites. So the question is, well, how wicked are they? And uh, it's interesting, if you read some of the literature um, on the Canaanite people, they're actually, they were really, really bad. Let me just give you some examples. Um, yeah, they were bad. They were bad. They did bad things. Um, examples. They would regularly burn and sacrifice their children. 
and not just infants, but uh, children as old as four years old, they would burn them in, in uh, scalding cauldrons, and they would play flutes and drums so that the wailing of the children couldn't be heard by the people. So regularly doing that. Uh, it was a highly sexualized culture, uh, regularly engaging in temple prostitution, uh, orgies, bestiality, adultery, uh, just you know, tons of terrible stuff. Uh, furthermore, they engaged in unwarranted attacks of a defenseless Israel. You know, it's just coming out of slavery, but yet they attacked them all the time. And so you wonder, so it's no wonder that God didn't want Israel to associate with the Canaanite people, um, you know, given the kinds of people they were. So the first thing is God was incredibly patient. The second point is that um, they are exceedingly wicked people. And the third thing to say, just in, in this first question, is that it's important to remember that the Old Testament covers around 2,000 years of history. And so the claim that, that, you know, we have this claim that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and judgment where the New Testament is a God of love, just like we heard, is misleading. And the New Testament only covers about 60 years. So my guess is if you extended the New Testament to an equal proportion of time, as, and, as uh, D.A. Carson said, you would see a lot more judgment as well there. And so, so the first question, does God judge the Canaanites to death? Does he do so, ar or when he does, does he do so arbitrarily? The answer is no for at least those three reasons. Okay, so I find that helpful. So far, are we good? Okay, so far. Okay, so that's the first question I would ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Just um, it was just a point that if you extend the New Testament to a comparable length of time as the Old Testament, you'd see a lot of wrath and judgment in there as well. And so um, it's just yeah, it's just kind of double clicking on that that idea that God is you know a God of judgment on in both testaments. Okay, second question that I would ask is this. Can God murder anyone? And by murder, by the way, we mean unjustified killing. So can God murder anyone? And the short answer is no. And so here there's a couple interesting little, I guess, wrinkles uh, that would be, I'll just point out. One, um, one is that scholars actually differ on the question of whether or not uh, God ordered the complete destruction of the Canaanite people. So if you read the Copen book, as it's floating around, uh, Paul Copen actually thinks that God didn't order the complete destruction of the Canaanite people. Um, and so he will talk about how, um, actually I was really surprised as I read it, because he says that the, uh, the conquest of the Israelites into the land of Canaan was actually a lot less bloody than we, we can imagine. And he talked about the historical evidence for Jericho. This was really interesting to me the first time I read it. But he said that Jericho, according to the archaeology, it was probably a small military outpost of about 100 soldiers. And there's no civilians, and there's no women or children, except for Rahab, the, the, the tavern keeper, which is typical in a military outpost. And so Jericho wasn't this huge city. Uh, it, it's just, it was a military outpost, and th that's all it was. And, and it was very small at that. And so, you know, so he points that kind of thing out. He also talks about, and you can, you'll see this in scripture, he talks about how in the ancient Near East, they engaged a lot of times in language that's called warfare hyperbole. And so you read in... Um, Joshua, and I, I could write down some examples like Joshua 10:40. Maybe look this up later, or 11, Joshua 11:12 11, through 15. Uh, in those passages, it's a, there's an example of what um, is called warfare hyperbole, where you you hear language like, you know, we will destroy everything that breathes, and we will wipe away every you know soul that there is, or things like that. And but clearly that's hyperbole. Why? What happens in Judges? Who do you find in Judges? Canaanites, everywhere. So clearly they didn't wipe away everybody. Um, and so, so, he, so Copen in that book and other books will document that, you know, the, the, and he, you know, he actually has examples of how this is common in other non-biblical texts that are talking about warfare. And so all of that to say, um, there's nothing in the narrative, uh, many scholars think, there's nothing in the narrative uh, that suggests that women and children were killed. Yeah. Could you just repeat those two sentences? Yes. Uh, these are just examples, there's lots, but Je Joshua 1040 and Joshua 11, 12 through 15. Okay, so the first, I guess, sort of, I was just um, pointing out that there's an issue. Maybe God didn't command the destruction of all the people. But say he did. So now we're back to the question. Say he did com uh, command the destruction of everybody. Well, was he wrong in doing that? And here's what I would say to that question. I would, say, I would say no. 
Um, as the giver of life, God can take someone's life if he wants. And in fact, on the Christian story, death isn't the extinction of a life, right? It's just a change in location. And if God is God and he created us, well, then he can change our location anytime he wants. And so God has, so the question, does God have the right to take anyone out? The answer is yes. And then the question is, well, what about the children? And again, one response is God has the right to give and take life as he sees fit. And then I would say, if you believe as I do in the salvation of children, well, then in one sense, they were given a great reward. And I'm going to show you a video where Bill Craig will talk about that in detail as well in a minute. So all that to say, it's not, so did God do any wrong in commanding the destruction of the Canaanites? Well, the adults were deserving of capital punishment because of their wickedness. Um, it's not clear that there were women and children that were, that were killed, but even if they were, they were given a greater good. The, the, I'm sorry, the children were given a greater good um, with immediate salvation and things like that. So that's at least a first step that I found helpful. And, it lay, and again, it doesn't answer, I know it doesn't answer all our questions, but that's the first step that I found helpful when you engage with people in this uh, topic. Okay, what are your questions on this? I went kind of brief over that. Do you argue that, you know, if you kill a kid it's instant salvation, by that line of logic, the Canaanites who were slaughtering kids up to four years old were doing a good thing by that? Yeah, well, true, except, um, and Bill's going to, he's going to address that, I think, nicely in the video. Um, or maybe it was in your book, I'm not sure, but um, somewhere in there. Um, so we're commanded to love our neighbor. Was that in the book? Um, I don't know where it was. I heard it somewhere. And so we don't have a, just a, a carte blanche command to kill people because they go to, be with go to be with God in heaven. We have a command to love our neighbors. Um, but, but God, as the giver of life, has that right to do whatever he wants. And so that we do not, but God does. And so that would be the distinction. Yeah. Right. True. Uh huh. No, I agree. I, I agree. But um, but the point that I was making there was um, that ancient hyperbole where it says, "And we destroyed everybody that breathes." Well, they actually didn't. Um, and so, yeah, we know. So so we know that. So we know that there's hyperbole. So it's not clear that God commanded them to destroy everyone. In fact, Copen says that the issue was uh, religious. Um, Bill Craig, in the video, he says the issue is over the land. Either way, they're, they're needing to separate from the, the culture around them so that God could have a nation, from which, by the way, every, every nation is blessed, including the Canaanites, um, so, which is, again, historically important context. But yeah, you're right. Uh, I was just, I was double-clicking on one thing, Sorry, one specific thing. Yeah. It's hard. This, is, this has been a hard one for me. So if you want to drill down deeper, check out either of those books as well. You guys want to watch a video? Uh, Bill Craig, uh, somebody asked about, um, he, he uh, was in, he, uh, people, let's see. What would Richard Dawkins say to these kinds of things? Uh, well, he was invited to debate William Lane Craig, the guy who is the author of your, one of your books, and Richard Dawkins turned it down. He didn't want to debate him because he doesn't take Bill Craig serious, he doesn't take evangelicals serious, uh, and so he wouldn't, you know, honor the same stage as, as a Christian. And he said, I would never debate somebody that believes in the genocide of you know, Canaanites is just. And so uh, about a year ago in Oxford, uh, Bill went there and he, like I said, he invited Richard Dawkins to debate him. Dawkins didn't show up and so Bill just gave a lecture kind of responding to Dawkins without Dawkins being there. And so what, we wanna, what I want to show you here is a fairly lengthy little clip, but it, it addresses a specific question about the Canaanites. And I really find it helpful um, just as another sort of angle on how to respond to this. So why don't we watch this? It'll be about 10 minutes. And hopefully this will help as well. Oh, where'd it go? Now a couple of questions, uh, representative of some others, on the problem of evil. And one, why did your infinitely smart designer invent? Is it evil? You get the idea. Um, and another one, uh, Dawkins accuses you of saying that genocide would be acceptable in some contexts. Have you ever said anything which warrants this view and what do you actually think? And I take that to be related to the problem of evil in that uh, the claim would be that if you take the Bible as representing the word of God, it suggests that he might be evil rather than good if he in fact did advocate genocide. I 
I am a Christian theologian, and so we'll answer this from a Christian perspective. From a Christian perspective, God didn't invent evil. Rather, he created free moral agents who have the ability either to obey God and do his will or to seek lesser goods rather than have their wills oriented toward God as the supreme good. And evil, as I understand it, is a privation of right order in the creaturely will. It is a, a, an absence of being correctly ordered toward God as the supreme good and focused instead on, an, on lesser goods. So evil is the byproduct of the misuse of human freedom, which is necessary for us to be moral agents who make significant moral choices. Apart from that, we would be mere animals or robots or puppets, and that's not the kind of uh, being that God wants. Now, I have not in any way ever said that God ha has commanded or could command genocide. That's an unsympathetic misrepresentation of what I said. What I was dealing with are these narratives in the Hebrew Bible concerning God's commands to Israel to go into the land of Canaan or the modern day land of Palestine and to drive out the Canaanite clans or tribes that were inhabiting the land. And in the Hebrew Bible, God commands Israelites to go in there and to slaughter uh, any of the Canaanites that uh, oppose them, whether man, woman, or child, they are to be exterminated. Now, anybody who takes the Bible to be historical has got to wrestle with these difficult texts. The, the question is, how could a God who is all loving, all good, and all holy issue such commands? Um, and why would he do so? How, is there some kind of internal inconsistency here? And what I argued was that when you look into these in the context of the narrative, you find that God held his people Israel in Egypt for 400 years before bringing them into the land of Canaan because he said the iniquity of the Canaanites is not yet complete. These people were not yet so debauched, so reprobate, that God would judge them. And so he held his people in abeyance until the iniquity of these Canaanite tribes was so pronounced, so they were so vile and so evil, that God finally used Israel as his means of bringing judgment upon these tribes in the same way that God would later use pagan nations like Babylon and Assyria to judge his own people, Israel, by allowing them to come in and sweep through the land and conquer the people. So that this represented God's judgment upon the, these uh, Canaanite tribes. And when you read the ancient non-biblical literature about these tribes, this was a culture that was incredibly evil. Clay Jones has written a, an article on this in Philosophia Christi in which he looks at some of these ancient texts. And the sort of the, the bestiality and uh, human sacrifice and the mockery of, of God that characterized this culture was really, really vile. And, and it, it raises the hair on your neck to read these texts of what these people were like. And it, this story of the conquest of Canaan only comes after the story of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And you may remember in that story, Abraham argues with God and says, God, if there are 50 righteous people in these cities, will you, will you destroy them? Will you destroy the good along with the unjust? And God says, no, for the sake of the 50, I will not destroy them. And then like a Middle Eastern merchant, uh, Abraham bargains with God. Well, God, if there are 40 in the city, will you destroy it? God says, no, for the sake of the 40 righteous people, I will not destroy it. And God says, uh, Abraham says, oh, God, don't be impatient with me. But if there are 10 righteous men in the city, will you destroy it? And God says, no, for the sake of the 10, I will not destroy it. And Abraham doesn't dare to argue any further with God. But the purpose of this story, which comes in the narrative prior to the conquest of Canaan, I think, is to emphasize that God is not going to judge these people until they are utterly, utterly deserving of 
judgment uh, because they are so debauched. So um, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is, is illustrative of why God held his people for 400 years before bringing them into the land. And when he brought them into the land to judge Canaan, what was that judgment? It was not to commit genocide. That is an utter misrepresentation. There was no racial war here. There was no command to pursue and hunt down the Canaanites and exterminate them all. What was the command? The command was to drive them out of the land. The land is what is, was and remains so all important to these Middle Eastern people. Who has the land? And what God was doing was destroying these Canaanite uh, petty kingdoms as nation states. He was destroying these nation states in effect by dispossessing of the, them of their land and bringing in the Israelites and giving the land over to Israel as the land of Israel, the promised land. And if these Canaanite tribes had simply fled before the advancing armies of Israel, no one would have been killed. There was no command to hunt down the Canaanites, no intention to kill them all off and eliminate them. It was only those who stayed behind to fight that would be killed. Uh, and in fact, there is nothing in the narrative to suggest that any women or children were killed. There is no narrative whatsoever that says that anybody other than combatants were killed in this cleansing of the land. And we really don't know how many actually were killed. This was apparently a gradual sort of dispossessing of the land that these tribes occupied. So the question is then, well, how could a god who is all holy and just and loving, command such a thing. And I think you can make sense of this through a divine command morality, which says that our moral duties are constituted by God's commands, so that when he issues commands to us, these become our moral duties. So Israel and the armies of Israel became, in effect, the instrument by which God judged these Canaanite peoples. The adults, deserve the judgment that they, they received if they stayed behind. Now the more difficult problem is the children. How could God command that the children be killed because these are innocent? And I think what I would want to say there is that God has the right to give and take life as he sees fit. Children die all the time, every day. Uh, people's lives are cut short. God is under no obligation whatsoever to prolong anyone's life another second. So he has the right to give and take life as he chooses. Moreover, if you believe as I do in the salvation of infants or children who die, what that meant was that these, the, the death of these children meant their salvation. They were the recipients of an infinite good as a result of their earthly phase of life being terminated. The problem is that people look at this from a naturalistic perspective and think life ends at the grave. But in fact, this was the salvation of these children and would be far better for them than continuing to be raised, say, in this reprobate uh, Canaanite culture. So I don't think God wronged anybody in commanding this to be done. He didn't wrong the adults because they were deserving of capital punishment. He didn't wrong the children if there were any that were killed, which we don't know, because God has the right to take their lives. And he, in fact, uh, in fact, they were the recipients of a great good. So I don't think there was anybody that was morally wronged in this affair. So it seems to me that it is possible for God to do so. I think only one thing needs to be added, and that is that God had morally sufficient reasons for issuing such an extraordinary command it, it needs to be understood as how extraordinary and out of the ordinary this, this command was. It is associated with the conquest of, of Canaan and the dispossession of the land and giving it to these people. And God, I think, had morally sufficient reasons for doing this because um, these people were due for judgment and by issuing so harsh an object lesson to Israel, by using them as his instruments, for bringing judgment in this way, he emphasized to them, as nothing else could do, how they were to be a holy people set apart for God himself, and not to follow after the pagan deities of Israel's neighbors, not to betray uh, their faith and, and apostatize 
and follow these Canaanite gods like Baal and, and Molech and others. This was an, a, an object lesson to them to preserve Israel and, their, and, and the salvation of these people, through which, of course, the instrumentality of Israel, he would eventually bring the Christ into the world and effect the salvation of the entire world through Christ. So I think God had morally sufficient reasons for doing such an extraordinary uh, thing, uh, which is really unique and uh, not something to be repeated or expected in any other time or age. Okay, so there's, there's another, I wish I could be as eloquent as Bill, he always n nails those things pretty well. Um, any thoughts, reactions to this or other questions on the Canaanite issue? We can move on after this too. Um, well, they were wicked people and they were rightly judged as such. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Does that make God uh, tyrannical? Yeah, I'm not, that's not quite how I'm reading it. Um, were, were you going to comment on uh, that? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not so sure I see the tyrannical thing because of the patience that he had before he drove them out. I mean, he rightly has the authority to judge us however he wants, and we know that he'll judge justly. And so, so I, I don't see the tyrannical part myself in there, but it might just be that I'm not, you know, um, understanding. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Can you, um, can you quickly describe the, the divine command? Well, theory? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just, so all the divine, he mentioned the divine command theory, uh, as a system of ethics, and it's basically one way to make sense of how we arrive at our moral duties and obligations. And so the divine, co divine command theory says that we arrive at our duties based on what God commands. And so if God commands us to love our neighbors or to drive out the Canaanites, then that's our, oblig that's our duty. And I think it was in your chapter, he mentioned something interesting about that, is that, did you guys notice that, but God has no duties? Did you guys catch that in the reading today? So part of that, part of it is that we have duties based on what God commands of us, but God is a holy good essentially you know, morally perfect being actually doesn't have duties himself. And so that's why, so that's just an interesting as aspect of the theory, but that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, if I was playing devil's advocate, I would have come back and said, well, then why didn't Jesus put it all the children? And right. everyone would have been like, I know it's taking up so much, but I feel like that would have been a really important thing to bring up then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know where now, uh, it's in the video I'm going to show you tomorrow, uh, that uh, Bill Maher, our friend from Re Religious, is going to bring that very thing up. And, and here's the reason, though. It all comes back to divine command theory. Um, well, we've been commanded to love our neighbors. So it might be a great good, and that's God's prerogative, because he doesn't have obligations. He doesn't have um, duties. So if he judges that as morally appropriate for some reason, we don't know what that is, that's okay for God. But we haven't been given a command to do that. We've been commanded to love our neighbors and to protect them. And so that's what helps, because I, I was actually the very first thing that raised in my mind, but that's, that's the fix uh, for me, so yeah. That even comes back to modern history, it's not a clear-cut issue. When you, look at, when you look at World War II, you look at Hitler, yeah. Stalin, those whole issues that came up, the ability to deal with those people in their, in their excessive mm -hmm. their genocides or other things that they're involved in doing required us to spill blood as well. Right. And we don't seem to have a problem with that, but when it's God that's doing the judging, all of a sudden the atheists have mm. a problem with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Good. Yeah. I think there was one line in Joshua when I read it last week that helped me, and it, it was before God was memorized, you know, but he said, he saw that their hearts were devoted to destruction. And that, yeah. that one phrase, devoted to destruction, really just helped me because. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can't see that part of it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I love it. We're gonna in a, in two days. We're gonna talk about the problem of evil and suffering, and it's gonna come right back up again. You know, um, God has reasons that we're just not we're not privy to, and and in fact, 
There's good reasons to think that we never will know all of God's reasons, but yet we can know that God acts righteously and right. Okay, well, that's just a little. I don't pretend to think that that'll satisfy you totally, but hopefully it just gets us sort of thinking uh, the right kinds of things that we'll need to address as we engage these things deeper. And then if you really want to drill down, um, check out some of those books that I have on your, that I listed at the end of this lecture. Um, let's go briefly now. We've got 20 minutes. Um, I think we'll skip some things, but let me just help you fill in your course pack on that third miss. I won't comment on much of these except to fill in the blanks for you here, but uh, this, this third miss was the fact that um, on atheism you can't even make moral ascriptions like that something is good or bad because there is no such thing as objective morality. And so there's an inconsistency there, and so your little bullet points are, number one, Dawkins' claim is utterly inconsistent with his total denial of objective goodness and evil. And like I said, he's on the record denying that there is such a thing as objective goodness and evil, and if that's the case, well then how can you make moral ascriptions about anything whatsoever? So that's just a, you know, it's just a complete inconsistency, and it's helpful to point those things out. Um, not to Richard Dawkins uh, necessarily, because he it won't bother him, but to those that you engage with. Yeah. Yes, he, yeah, some, uh, Ashley just asked that too. He, he has debated, he debated an Anglican uh, last year. He debated John Lennox, I believe, about a year, two years ago. And I wish, I should go listen to that because John Lennox is a great thinker. Um, and I'm not sure how that, go, how that debate went, but I'm sure Lennox did great. But here's actually something John Lennox says, and I think this applies to Dawkins, by the way. He said, and I, Lennox is one of those wise, wise people that's been around, if you know this name. He's older gentleman. Um, but he said that if somebody doesn't listen to reason, well, then it's probably not reason that's keeping them from Christ. And I think in Dawkins' case and in other cases, you can point these things out, but at the point where they cease to listen, well, that's because reason isn't what's keeping them from God. So yes, he does debate people, but he won't debate Bill. And we can, well, we can surmise why. Um, okay. Second thing here, historically, uh, biblical theism, including the Old Testament, has served as a moral compass to Western culture, oh, despite a number of notable deviations from Scripture, teaching, Scripture's teachings across the century, you know, and that's just important, you know, people bring up what about the Crusades, what about other evil things that people have done in the name of God, and, and the simple, quick response is, look, when Christians do evil in the name of God, well, we're just acting inconsistent with our own teachings, but on atheism, you're not acting inconsistent with anything, because there is no objective way things ought to go, and so that's, that's the quick thing there. And then last, third bullet point there, biblical theism with its emphasis on God's creating humans in his image is our best hope for grounding objective morality and human dignity. Yes, Michelle. Oh, um, yeah, maybe it didn't. Uh, let's see, despite a number of notable deviations, so deviations is the blank, yeah, from scripture. Yeah, thanks. Okay, what I think I'll do for the last 20 minutes or 15 minutes is, um, so the next part of your handout is engaging the moral argument and kind of double clicking on this question, can atheism provide an answer to morality? And so you read in chapter six of Bill Craig's book, you saw a really nice presentation of what's called the moral argument for God's existence. Uh, two syllogism or two premises and a conclusion. It's a it's a it's a, a syllogism. It's an argument. Uh, if the premises are true, the conclusion necessarily follows, and so all you need to do is defend the two premises, and the conclusion follows. So maybe in light of me going through that, since I know you can all read, um, uh, why don't I just ask for a few minutes? Do you guys have any questions about the moral argument? So I'm trying to skip through some things. Um, are there anything that, as you read in your readings today from chapter six, that you want to? Did you have questions you don't quite understand or just want to bring up? Yeah, let's go. I'm having trouble with uh, Craig moving from there being objective moral value to duty. I like how he distinguishes them. I just feel like he's saying that it's a magician trick trying to get us to say that we have, since we can do that, we now ought to have a duty to do that. Since, say the first thing, since what? Okay. Yeah, could you just, um, you could get rid of one or the other. You don't need, you don't need both. Okay. So I, I actually would prefer to do d duties myself. Because um, it seems clear that we have duties. You know, I have a duty to be honest to you or not steal your wallet or something. 
Um, and so that's all you need to make the argument work. He just added both. Um, so, so they're separate, they're distinct. You could use either values or duties and the argument would go through. Is that all? Is that take care of your worry or is there something? Um, more of, like for example, say if I find a law on the ground and there's $200 in it, mm -hmm. and Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So you would want to say that premise two works for you if it's there are objective moral, moral values, but you're not so inclined to premise two if it is there are objective moral duties. Yeah, I'm more having trouble how to get there. Oh, okay. Well, he, it's just um, this is how he gets there. If you, know, if you read sort of carefully the first part of that, he's basically saying, look, the same faculties that you have that give you um, uh, trustworthiness that your <coughs> senses are perceiving in an external world. Well, you have a moral faculty and you can perceive values and you can perceive duties in the same way. So he's saying if you think that your senses are reliable to see that there's a table here, well, you, you should also say that your senses are reliable because you see that duty to give that wallet back to whoever, whoever that wallet is. So, he, so he's saying it's on par with the trustworthiness of our senses for the reality of a physical world. The argument that there's moral facts is on par because we have a faculty, a moral sense or moral faculty that perceives that duty. So in essence, that's actually what he's arguing. That you just know. We know we have duties, and that's all it takes. And I think that that's actually pretty solid. Do you want to push back on that, though, Scott? Is that helpful? Or? OK, yeah, just think about it. it. Read the first part where he talks about Sorel, and, and that's kind of where he just says, this is, we can just see this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, well, I, I'll just tell you what I would say to that, actually. Um, so if, if we want to ground, so there's a number of ways to ground objective morality. There's actually five. So say, there's a, say, we, say we think there's objective morality. Here's your five options. Um, you can ground it in culture. You can ground it in the individual. You can ground it in evolution. You can ground it in just what we call brute fact atheism, which is kind of his platonic atheism in the book, or you can ground it in theism. So there's your five options. Maybe there's more, but these, you know, it seems to me that these would be the main ones. So here's the thing, though, and this is me talking. This is um, these three. All they get you is subjective morality. So if you ground, if you're trying to ground morality and culture, so whatever is. Morally true is whatever your culture says it is that says is morally, you know, obliga obligatory. Well, that's actually a rel that's culturally subjective or relative, and so you don't so so this isn't going to work. You're not and I, if we had more time. Actually, I might go into that a little more next week. Um, it, but you're not going to get um, you're not going to get objective morality if you ground it in culture because our cultures change. We have different mores, different things. So too with this. You're not going to get objective morality if you ground it in, in the individual because we all have different views on what is right and wrong. But here's the thing, I actually think if you're going to ground morality in an evolution, and I'm not alone in this, well then you can't get objective morality. You only get subjective morality. Because on evolution there is no such thing as essences, there's no way things ought to be, there's just what is the case. So you only have is, you don't have ought. You only have physical facts, you don't have moral facts. And so you can have moral facts that supervene on physical facts, if I want to get technical for a minute, but there's nothing that's objectively the case. So it might be that it's beneficial to our species to be altruistic, even, or something, or to, I don't know, have a social contract that, so we get along. But it might be when we become Cylons or something that that's not what's, you know, <laughs> beneficial or something, because we'll evolve to some other morality. And so it's not actually objective at that point. So that's what I would do. So actually what I think you are, at the end of the day, you only have two options if you want objective morality. So if, if you accept that premise that says there is objective values or objective duties, I think you only have two options. 
brute fact atheism, kind of your platonic atheism, or theism. So is that, so that's what I would say. Is that helpful? And that's fine. And then just steal their wallet and walk away. <laughs> and so, I mean, <laughs> sorry, but you know what I mean. So, so what do you do in that case? Well, then you push them. So here's what you do without, I'm sorry, joking. Um, is you push, their, you push their position to their logical conclusion. So what that means is that you think there's no moral difference between Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler. If you're okay with that, well, then we can all be moral relativists. But if you're not okay with that, well, then you're actually not a moral relativist. So I would say that your friends actually are not moral relativists, and you just have to show them that they're not. That's what I would do. And if they are at that point, then again, you, you walk away. Um, because there's nothing that you can convince them, because it's not reason that's keeping them from that view. So here's the thing. Given atheism, uh, atheism, you, if this is your best atheistic option, brute fact atheism, kind of platonic forms out there that ground morality or something like that, well, um, if that's your best option, well, that's, re that's really not a good option. And maybe we could go into that, but it just doesn't work. So what, what happens at the end of the day is really atheism is not, it, 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 it's, it's unable to provide a basis for morality on atheism. So there is no objective ground. And Richard Dawkins, I think, is consistent on that point. Um, he just admits it. And so what happens, though, if you can't ground morality, what you end up with is chaos. And so you have the Columbine shooters, you remember them years ago? Who, the Time Magazine reported on this horrific interchange that took place during the Columbine where one of the shooters went up to a, a girl and said, she, he asked, do you believe in God? And uh, knowing, certainly knowing the consequences of her answer, she said, yes, I do believe in God and you need to follow in his path. <laughs> and the shooter said, there is no God, and he pulled the trigger. And what that represents is a, a, a snapshot of moral nihilism. If there is no God, anything goes, and the result is chaos. Okay, so this is the, re this is the logic of uh, atheism's inability to ground morality. And what's interesting is there's actually a connection. There's actually a logical connection. If we had time, I could map this out for you. But there's a logical connection between telos, or purpose, and ethics. So for example, if God, uh, if there's no purpose, well then there's no oughts that are entailed by that purpose. And so uh, anything goes, as that gunman in Columbine so graphically illustrated. So what happens with morality? If you throw out morality on atheism, what you get is chaos. Now let me, let me shift to the next part of your structure notes. And I just want to talk it through because it'll help me land the plane where I want to today. Um, the next section was this comment that, uh, Atheism provides no answer to the universal search for meaning. Do you see that on your notes? So here's the thing. So Bertrand Russell, if you haven't heard this name, he's, he's my favorite atheist. Whenever I teach philosophy, Bertrand Russell is the, my go-to guy because he's really consistent on most things. And, um, and so he's just a great foil. But um, Bertrand Russell, if you don't know, he lived from like 1870 to, no, 1872 to 1970. So like 100 years. Think of all the history that this guy lived through. And um, he was one of the more well-known atheists uh, you know, in that century. And in the 1920s, he wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. It's kind of like the, I don't know, God delusion of the 1920s or something. And in there, he has a chapter called A Free Man's Worship. And I highly recommend this chapter to you. In that chapter, he says this. He says, if we're just a, a, a co-location of atoms, all we can do is build our lives on the firm foundation of unyielding despair. And I think he's right. If we're just this co-location of the evolutionary process, all we can do is build our lives on the firm foundation of unyielding despair. Think of Henry David Thoreau. He spent all of his life searching for meaning. And what's the famous you know, quip? All men lead lives of quiet despair, right? But here's the thing. I suggest, and this is why I love the Lewis quote here, that we begin in our evangelism and in our own lives to pay attention to our longings. Because I think that our longings actually show us something that we've lost. And I think that God actually pursues us through our longings. And what is the, human, what is the universal human longing? For meaning, for purpose, and for, for, for value. This is the universal longing. So I love this Lewis quote from Mere Christianity. You know, if I find something, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I think that Lewis is right. And so I would just encourage you to pay attention to, to your longings. Um, so, but here's the thing. On atheism, 
If there's no meaning, what you get is despair. So we have a world of chaos, we have a world of despair apart from, uh, apart from God, if atheism is true. And so I would just push back on those who you know, want to deny that God exists. Well, how do you account for value? How do you account for meaning? How do you account for purpose? Um, because only, uh, I think, Christianity uh, can give you those things. And so this is where I want to end. Let me end again with a story, if I can, today. And this is your last section. I guess it'd be a V, section five. And it's this question that I ask in your handout, is Christianity good for the world? And let me, um, let me, just, give you, let me just tell you a little bit about that question. So a couple years ago, I was asked to do an outreach at Ball State University in Muncie, um, Indiana. And they basically said, come in and answer this question. Is Christianity good for the world? And it was actually a really neat outreach that they did uh, because it was a week-long outreach and they had big banner, or I don't know, like huge uh, pieces of wood that people could write their answer to that question all week long. And then they did a, a number of outreaches. The first night they did an outreach and it was uh, exploring the relationship between uh, Jesus and beauty. And so they had a coffee house and they had, they had poetry reading and music and things like that. It was just kind of interacting Jesus and beauty and showing the connections. The next night they had an outreach and it was showing the connection between Jesus and ideas. And so they, uh, they watched a video debate of a guy named Christopher Hitchens, one of those four horsemen, and Doug Wilson on that question, is Christianity good for the world? And explored that. Uh, the next night they did uh, an outreach exploring the connection between Jesus and the nations, which I thought was really cool. And they explored that connection. They had an international dinner and they invited people from all over. Um, the world and, and explored it. And then I was supposed to come in like last night and answer the question. Is Christianity good for the world? And let me tell you the answer. The, fortunately, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> that's good. And I, gave, I, I said for two reasons, and there they are. I said Christianity is good for the world. One, because it's true. And being rightly related to reality is a good in and of itself. That's the first reason. But the second reason that Christianity is good for the world is because you get Jesus. And when you get Jesus, you get everything. And so as we close, as we finish up our section, I want to return to that subtext that I have for you tonight, and that, or today. And that's this idea that I want to help convince you of the possibility that God is better than you think, that God is better than the students, that, that students think that we engage. And, and I think in the New Testament, we actually get a picture of why God is better than we think. And I've been, it's been percolating uh, under the surface all, all afternoon. And why is it? Well, it's because God pursues us. God pursues us even when we sin, and he woos us through our longings back to him. And that is an absolutely subversive theme through scripture that is subversive to the culture uh, in which the gospel is embedded. And this, is, this has become so sort of pressing to me, and I, I want to share, uh, so has anybody read Frankenstein? Another favorite, favorite book. Yeah, great, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein. If you haven't read it, read it. Um, what I love about that is the moment of creation when Victor Frankenstein, this scientist, and has been slaving away, all, slaving away all night in this, this lab, trying to create this, this monster. And if you go back to the account of when the monster comes alive, it's really a chilling uh, story where you know, it talks about these dull yellow eyes that open up and, and, and he sees life. And, and so here we have Victor Frankenstein, the, the, the scientist, looking down at this monster that he's created, this creature that he's created. And instead of being filled with joy and, and delight at what he's created, he's filled with horror at this, this monster that he's created. And so what does he do? Do you guys remember? He runs. He runs away into the bedchamber next to, next to this little room, this lab. And the, the monster, the creature, gets up and pursues his creator. And he reaches for him. And he wants purpose. And what does Fra Victor Frankenstein do? He runs out the window. And he runs away from this monster. And so the monster runs after him. And then if you read the story, it's basically the monster is looking for acceptance in the human uh, community. And he doesn't find any. And so what's he do? Well, he, he, since his creator didn't give him a purpose, he takes on a purpose of his own, which is to kill his creator. And what this does, what, what I think Mary Shelley does so well is, is illustrate the inescapability of the creator-creature relationship, that we just can't escape that, right? We are fundamentally religious because we've been created. And, and what I love about the creation story, it's like the reverse Frankenstein. Here we have... God creating us lovingly in his image. And what do we do? We run from the creator. But, listen, but look at what God does. He doesn't run away. He actually pursues us. And to me, that is why God is better than we think. We, don't run, we run from him, but God runs after us. And that is, that is amazing. 
And so a couple years ago, uh, Tolian Tavidigin, if you guys know that name, I don't know if I said it right, he wrote a book called Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything. Excellent book. I highly recommend that to you as well. Let's just change it as we close. And I will let me, if I could close this in prayer, but let's just change it to Yahweh plus, every, plus nothing equals everything. Okay? Fair enough? Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you for um, the fact that you do pursue us and that you love us and that uh, I love the, the Mary Shelley story and how that to me illustrates how amazing it is that you would pursue us and that, in fact, it's a comedy. It's a divine comedy. It's an unexpected turn that you would pursue us even in our tragedy. And Lord, I pray uh, as we go from here that you would convince us again in our hearts and in our minds that you are worthy of our lives. Lord, I pray, I, you know, this is a hard topic today, and I know it's only going to get harder each day uh, as we engage these things, Lord, w but would we do that for the sake of the lost? Would we do that for the sake of our own hearts, that we would love you with our minds and our hearts, and it would flow into helping hands and, uh, a, a, you know, just a, a winsome spirit as we engage this world that desperately needs you? Lord, thank you that you pursue us. Thank you that you run after us. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to join you in that as we pursue others for you. We love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for keeping us awake. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.